that? All right. There's been a, a pattern of the style of sermons that I've been preaching, and it wasn't necessarily, you know, chosen out. It just kind of, you know, I just kind of fell into this rut of preaching a style of sermon in the morning. And then also, of course, I've had, you know, the series that I've been preaching on Sunday evenings. And the, the Saturday mo- or the, I'm sorry, the Sunday morning sermons, they've been kind of a uh, uh, you know, stories with creative applications, or they've been doctrines where I've been kind of using creative applications that have applied to recent events. And for example, last week I preached on the freedom of the resurrection, which applies to recent events and things that have been going on. And if you remember, you know, I, I preached on the subject about there is light at the end of the tunnel, which had kind of a creative application and, and you know, uh, uh, used an application for our church here and everything. But yesterday, and every anyone who's ever written a sermon knows exactly what this is like. Uh, midday, I sat down <clears throat> and my mind just, you know, I, I wanted to, I felt as if I wanted to write a sermon that was geared towards a creative application of a story as I have been doing. But I kept being pushed away from that. And I sat down and I went through a couple of ideas of, of you know, sermons that I was going to preach on. But it, I kept being brought back to the same particular subject. And the title of the sermon this morning is this, The Destructive Nature of Adultery. The Destructive nature of adultery. I want you to look with me and we're going to read this verse right now. I'm going to give a quick introduction and then I'm going to come back to this verse once more. I want you to look with me at Proverbs chapter number 6 verse number 23. <clears throat> Proverbs chapter number 6 verse number 23. The Bible says this, for the, for the commandment is a lamp and the law is light and reproofs of instructions are the way of life. <clears throat> Verse 24, to keep thee from the evil woman, from the flattery of the tongue of a strange woman. Lust not after her beauty in thine heart, neither let her take thee with her eyelids. For by means of a whorish woman, a man is brought to a piece of bread, and the adulteress will hunt for the precious life. Can a man take fire in his bosom and his clothes not be burned? Can one go upon hot coals and his feet not be burned? So he that goeth in to his neighbor's wife, whosoever toucheth her, shall not be innocent. Men do not despise a thief if he steal to satisfy his soul when he is hungry, but if he be found, he shall restore sevenfold. He shall give all the substance of his house. Now verse 32 I want to focus on. And I'll go ahead and tell you this now. I want these words in this particular text to be in your mind, please, while I'm going through the sermon. And we're going to come back to this. I'm going to exposit it more at the end of the sermon. But verse 32 is really where I derive uh, the title and where I derive the overall theme of the sermon. It says this, But whoso committeth adultery with a woman lacketh understanding. And then it says this, He that doeth it destroyeth his own soul. So the title of the sermon again is The Destructive Nature of Adultery. The Destructive Nature of Adultery. Now, what I'm going to be doing this morning is I want you to understand the severity of adultery. I want you to understand how destructive, how bad, how painful, and how harmful adultery is. Notice the very first thing that it says is, But whoso committeth adultery with a woman lacketh understanding. I want you to walk away with understanding this morning. And what I want you to understand is this. He that doeth it destroyeth his own soul. I want you to understand the destructive nature of adultery. And notice the word that's used there. <coughs> it says destroyeth his own soul. Your soul obviously is a way to, to refer to the inner you. It's a way to get to the core of who you are as a person. It's, the, it's a way to speak not in, not in shallow terms but in terms of depth. So I want you to notice there that when it talks about the destruction that you bring upon your life, then it says that you bring, you bring the type of destruction that destroys your soul. Now in this introduction that I'm going to get into, and this is going to be quick, I want everyone to pay close attention, even the children. I want them to pay close, close attention during the introduction of the sermon this morning. And I also want to give a disclaimer that if there's anyone that happens to be here that this applies to or, or anything like that, I'm not preaching this to hurt you. I'm not preaching this at all. I'm actually preaching this to warn those that have not you know, been affected by this sin, that have not you know, otherwise committed this sin and been the perpetrator of this sin because you know the the the, the uh, preacher the pastor of a church is commanded 
commanded to stand up and he is commanded to preach. You know, he's commanded, spare not and lift up thy voice like a trumpet and show my people their transgressions and the house of Jacob their sins. A preacher is commanded to preach on sin and to warn people about the consequences and the punishments of sin to forewarn them so that they don't fall into those sins. Or maybe otherwise do not fall into those sins again if they've already committed them. That's the purpose of this sermon. So if anything you know, hurts you or anything that I preach this morning, it's not meant to do that. It's meant to warn people so that this sin does not occur again. Every person that's in here today, this is my goal. Every single person that hears this, this sermon this morning, I want every person under the sound of my voice to, to when you walk out of here, to never even get close to committing this sin. I want every person in here to, with all of your unction, with all of your, you know, your, your faculties that you have, to even, if you could, warn other people and understand the seriousness of this. I want no one to fall into this sin. That's the purpose of this morning's sermon. The introduction is this. There is no other sin in the Bible. And I, and I want to be clear as well with this. I'm not just saying this because this just so happens to be the, the sermon that I'm preaching this morning. You know, I, if I preach on another sermon next week about, you know, a different sin, I'm not going to repeat the same thing. It's not just to make this sin and to, uh, this sermon better or anything like that. This is the truth. There is no sin... There is no sin that exists. There's no sin that is preached against or that is talked about in the Bible that is destructive, as destructive as adultery. Adultery is the most destructive sin that there is. Out of all sins, it is the most destructive, painful, harmful, just, just uh, injurious sin that exists. That's one of the things I want you to think about while we are going through uh, you know, all of the different teachings. I'll give you two reasons why, and I'm going to hit on these over and over again, because you're going to see it as a reoccurring theme. Number one is this. It is a sin, unfortunately, that is irreparable. It is a sin that is irreparable. Now, of course, if you're not saved, you could receive you know, forgiveness. And you could be saved, and it's a sin that could be forgiven. You know, If you were the perpetrator or victim, obviously, you could get over it to a degree. You could move past it and things like that. But it's a sin that leaves deep scars. It's a sin that leaves deep wounds and deep harm that, yeah, to a degree, you can get past it. But it, many other sins, theft, things along those lines, you can completely forget about them. They can be left in the past. You'll never remember them. Adultery is not like that. Adultery is a sin that in a vast way it is irreparable. That's why it's so important to stay away from it. Point number two is this, that adultery, because it's irreparable, adultery is a sin that changes the entire course of your life. Adultery is a sin that once it is found out, that it is going to immediately redirect or change the entire course of your life. I know many people, not just a few, I probably know 10 people at least that are Bible-believing Christians, that are independent Baptists, that are just like us, King James only, and some of them even pastors, two situations where pastors were involved where they <clears throat> fell into this sin or was the victim of this sin, that, that marriage, you know, this took place in their sin. But I, or, I'm sorry, in their marriage. This sin took place in their marriage. Every last one of them, the pastors, every last one of them, I can tell you this, that their lives changed drastically after this, after this particular sin entered in. That their, it, their lives changed drastically. It redirected the course of their lives in many different ways. It not only affects you, but it affects all of the people that are around you. This is another reason why it's so destructive. It not only affects you as the perpetrator, the victim, but it affects those that are within your family. It affects those that are your parents, that are your in-laws. It affects everyone around you. I want you to go ahead and I want you to turn to Exodus chapter number 20. So that is the introduction. I hope that everyone was paying attention, including the children. Children can learn from this and, and see what the Bible teaches about adultery and how bad that it is. So those are the two things that, that, that emphasize the destructive nature of adultery that we're going to hit on. Number one, it's irreparable. It is an irreparable to some degree. Yeah, you can you know, repair it and, uh, you know, to, to, to an extent. But there will always be a scar and a wound there, that you know, unlike any other sins. Like I said, theft, you could just totally forget about that. That's something you, you probably, you've probably stolen things when you were a kid. I'm sure all of us have, and you don't even remember it, right? You've probably said bad things or hurtful things to people you don't even remember, right? 
Adultery is not like that. It's something that is irreparable to a degree. Yes, praise God that we have comfort and peace in the Lord Jesus Christ. And yes, he's there for us. And we can move past it in a major way. But it is something that is irreparable to a certain degree. Not only that, it changes the course of your life. I want you to keep these things in your mind. Exodus chapter number 20, verse number 14. Here's the Ten Commandments, which are the basis and the foundation for all morality. Exodus chapter number 20, verse number 14 says this. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Of course, the Ten Commandments are very, very famous. Everyone is very familiar with the Ten Commandments. And as I said, it's the basis for all of our morality. All of our other laws that we read about, they're based in some way off of the Ten Commandments. <coughs> Deuteronomy chapter number 5, verse number 18 <coughs> is just the repetition of the Ten Commandments. And it says this, Neither shalt thou commit, excuse me, adultery. So I want to begin with a very clear, just unequivocal command from God in the Bible, found in the Ten Commandments for crying out loud, where the Bible commands us, thou shalt not commit adultery. So God tells you, he gives you a command, it's not a suggestion, it's not a recommendation, God imperatively commands you with force, thou shalt not commit adultery. Of course, the commands are for all of mankind. This is, make sure you look closely at Jeremiah, this is his first time bringing me water. Had some goofy smile on his face. <laughs> um, so, you know, that is, that is a strong command where he is serious, you know, it is imperative. Those are strong words. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Adultery. That's something just to memorize as a child. It'd be perfect for a child to memorize that. As an adult, we can memorize that. My very first scripture that I ever memorized in my life, I was 21 years old. I was just worldly, just getting out of the world. I grew up, you know, IFB, but I, I, I lived a very sinful life in my, you know, teenage years. I was very, you know, uh, uh, ashamed of that, but I wanted to get my life right at 21. And the very first passage that I ever memorized was Proverbs chapter number 6 where we just began. Verses 22 through about 28 or 29, something like that. Because I wanted to make sure you know, that I guarded my heart from this particular sin. If that's too much for you, you know where you should start is right here. Exodus chapter 20 verse 14. Those are powerful words. Thou shalt not commit adultery. I want to get the Bible's definition of what adultery is here early on in the sermon. Please turn to Numbers chapter number 5 verse number 29. <coughs> Numbers chapter number 5 verse number 29. Now if you look up adultery just in a, a modern dictionary, this is the, uh, the uh, definition of adultery. So I'm going to exchange out a word here, but it says this, voluntary sensual, that's the word I'm exchanging, voluntary sensual intercourse between a married person and a person who is not his or her spouse. So it is voluntary sensual intercourse between a married person and a person who is not his or her spouse. My just, you know, uh, uh, my own, uh, you know, definition if I were just to describe it in my own words would be this. It is the act of a man or woman going to bed with or lying with someone whom they are not married to. The act of a man or woman going to bed with or lying with someone whom they are not married to. So that would be a married person that were to go to bed with another person that they are not married to. So, you know, and as you know, the Bible's definitions, when the Bible, you know, describes something, it uses what is known as euphemisms. And a euphemism is where if you are talking about something that is somewhat of, a, uh, of an unclean subject, the Bible will substitute clean words, you know, so as not to put something, a dirty thought into your mind, right? You know, so that's what the Bible does right here. I want you to look with me at Numbers chapter number 5, verse number 29. It says this, this is the law of jealousies. And it says this, this is the definition according to the Bible of adultery. When a wife goeth aside to another instead of her husband. And then it says, and is defiled. Look at Numbers chapter number 5 verse number 20. It's a perfect definition of adultery. It says this, but if thou hast gone aside to another instead of thy husband, and, and if thou be defiled, and then it repeats it and says this, <coughs> and some man have lain with thee beside thine 
husband. So I looked up the word adultery. I looked up the passages that spoke of adultery. And here we have a perfect definition in the Bible's words of what adultery actually is. Adultery is where a man or a woman goes aside. You know, that means away from their spouse, away from their husband or their wife. They go aside and they lie with another that is not their husband or is not their wife. That is a perfect definition of adultery. Ezekiel chapter number 16 verse number 32 says almost the same thing. But as a wife that committeth adultery, which taketh strangers instead of her husband. When it's saying strangers, it's just saying someone other than her husband, right? Or it'd be the same way to say that if a man took someone other than his wife. I want you to go now, I want you to turn in your Bibles to Hebrews chapter number 13. So now we have the definition of what adultery is. We also know some of the, uh, the harmful effects, and we're going to you know, hit in some of how it is so destructive, some of the things that, you know, uh, uh, of the nature of it that make it so destructive. We saw that in the introduction. <clears throat> At this point, I'm going to give you a couple of, uh, of additional points. Uh, I want to highlight something right now, specifically in these next few verses, and that is one of the destructive things or, or one of the destructive natures of adultery is how dirty and how filthy and how unclean adultery is. Is. Now, when we read just now, I don't know if you noticed this or not, but there was certain language that was used both, time when it's, both times when it spoke of this. It said in Numbers chapter number 5, verse number 29, it said, When a wife goeth aside to another instead of her husband, it says, and is defiled. Now, when something is defiled, what that means is it is unclean. It has now become impure, or it is something that is dirty, or it is something that is filthy. <clears throat> Numbers chapter number 5, verse number 20 said something very similar. It said, But if thou hast gone aside to another instead of thy husband, and if thou be defiled. So notice both times when it speaks about adultery here, it talks about it being dirty. It talks about it being filthy. It talks about it being something that is nasty or that is disgusting. So this is one of the reasons and, and one of the things that causes adultery to be so destructive. And that is because it is an act that is very dirty and it is an act that is very disgusting and filthy. So I had you turn to Hebrews chapter number 13 verse number 4. I'm going to turn there myself, but I'm also going to read to you from Numbers chapter 5 verse 28. Numbers chapter 5 verse number 28 says this, And if the woman be not defiled, but be clean. So notice that. If the woman be not defiled, but be clean. So what is she? she, she if she was you know, uh, the one that went aside and committed this act on her husband, she would be unclean. That would cause her to be unclean. It says, not defiled, but but be un or but be clean. I'm sorry. Then she shall be free and shall conceive seed. So notice that it is a dirty act or a filthy act. Look at Hebrews chapter number thirteen, verse number four. Hebrews chapter number thirteen, verse number four. The Bible says this: <coughs> Marriage is honorable in all, and the bed undefiled. That's talking about within marriage. This act taking place between two married people or a married couple. Marriage is honorable in all and the bed undefiled. Then it says this, but whoremongers and adulterers God will judge. So there's a lot there, but right now what I want to focus on, I want you to notice that it contrasts two things. It talks about the bed within marriage being undefiled. Then it says this, but whoremongers and adulterers God will judge. So notice what it refers to the person that goes outside of marriage and dishonors that, that sanctity and that unity that takes place within marriage, the vows and everything that goes on there. Notice what it contrasts that with, instead of it being defiled over here on this side, or undefiled, I'm sorry, being clean, over here on this side, it says whoremonger and adulterer. It says, but whoremongers and adulterers. What is the implication? That it is unclean. I want you to notice that. And I want you to notice the words that are used to describe this. This is the Bible, not me. You know, I'm not just up here, you know, go, taking things way too far, using words and describing this with words that, you know, that I shouldn't be saying behind the pulpit. This is the Bible. The Bible says, speaking about the person that would go outside of marriage and would commit such an act, it's talking about this being unclean and it says this, but whoremongers and adulterers, God will judge. So notice that. The person that would commit this act is referred to as a whoremonger, 
and an adulterer. Let me ask you this. Do you think a whoremonger is a clean person? A person that you would describe as a whore or a whoremonger. A whore would be the female, whoremonger would be a male. Is that a clean person? Is that someone that lives a clean life? How would you describe a prostitute? What's one of the first words that would come to your mind? Because right now, it's talking about a person that commits adultery and it decides to use the word whore or whoremonger. What would you say if I said, give me five words to describe a prostitute? I guarantee that one of those words would be nasty. I guarantee that one of those words would be filthy. Why do you think it's contrasting defiled and undefiled? Because it's dirty, it's nasty, and it's filthy. And this is one of the reasons why committing adultery is so destructive is because it's unclean and it's nasty and it's disgusting. I want you to go now to Isaiah chapter number 57, verse number 3. Jeremiah chapter number 3, verse number 8. I want you to listen to how this is described in no uncertain terms, no, you know, holds bar. Listen. And I saw when for all the causes whereby backsliding Israel committed adultery, I had put her away and given her a bill of divorcement. Then it says this, yet her treacherous sister Judah feared not. Did you notice that? Yet her treacherous sister Judah feared not, <clears throat> but went and played the harlot also. What's a harlot? It's another word for a whore. It's another word for a prostitute. It says, but went and played the whore, or I'm sorry, the harlot also. And it came to pass through the lightness of her whoredom that she, watch this, defiled the land and committed adultery with stones and with stocks. Notice in these, just these two verses that I just read, in Jeremiah chapter number 3, verse number 8 and 9, notice the words we keep seeing. It's the same words we saw in Hebrews chapter 13, isn't it? Defiled, whoredom, whore. We saw uh, um, adultery. Do you notice that? What is an adulterer likened unto? A whore. What is, 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 is a, uh, an adulterer likened unto? Someone that is unclean and defiled and dirty. Look at Isaiah chapter number 57, verse number 3. But draw near hither, ye sons of the sorceress. And then it says this. The seed of the adulterer and the whore. So notice again, what do we see the word adulterer coupled with? Whore. Now, is an adulterer exactly the same as a whore? Is, are they just one in the same? What does it mean? What is the actual definition? What does it mean to actually be a whore? Because we'll use this loosely, but we use it for this very reason. What is a whore? What is the definition of a whore? It's a prostitute. That is specifically what a whore is. A whore is a prostitute. Now, oftentimes people will refer to someone that is not a prostitute, but is just very, you know, uh, uh, just we would say gets around, right? They would refer to that person as a whore, but they're not literally a prostitute, but we're saying that because why? Because they act like one. They're getting around like a prostitute would get around. So what's the purpose of doing that? It's to say that person's dirty. It's to say that person's nasty. Now, this is not my own equivocation here. This is the Bible when it's speaking about an adulterer over and over and over again. Do you know what it brings up? A whore or a whoremonger. Now, if, if, like I said, when, when, when the idea of a prostitute pops up in your mind, is, does it bring up someone that you would think is a very clean person? No, it brings up someone that is a disease-infected, a disease-ridden person walking around with all different types of diseases, doesn't it? Now that's just what the Bible equivocates here, not me. It equates the two. Every time we see here adultery, it says defiled. Every time we see here adulteress or, or, or a, an adulterer or adultery, it says whoremonger, harlot, right? Over and over and over again. Do you know why? Because adultery is nasty. Because adultery is dirty. Because adultery is filthy and it's disgusting. And because of that, it is destructive. I want you to go now to go to the book of Jeremiah where I'm at here. Go to Jeremiah chapter 23 verse 14. Jeremiah chapter number 23 verse 14. Jeremiah 5 7 says this, How shall I pardon thee for this? Thy children have forsaken me and sworn by them that are no gods. When I had fed them to the full, they then committed adultery. Now watch this. And assembled themselves by troops in the harlot's houses. Now you may not know this if you haven't looked this word up specifically, uh, but you probably thought otherwise. I know that I did in the past. <clears throat> that you would probably assume that the word adultery is used a ton in the Bible, wouldn't you? 
It's actually not used that much. It's not used as much as you would think it is. Like the word theft or to steal is used many, many more times. Other sins and things like that. Now, adultery is talked about quite often. It's, it's brought up quite a bit. But it's not used near as much as you would expect it to be used. That specific word adultery, adulteress, or you know, adulterer, you know, it's probably used around 30, 40 times. That's not that many times. I would expect I would have expected otherwise, you know, being a Bible student and reading the Bible through, you know, over and over again, I would have thought, man, it's used a lot. It's talked about, but the word itself is not used. But when you look it up, do you know what you find almost every time when you look up the word adultery? I'm talking almost every time. Whore. Whoremonger, harlot. What's it being likened unto? Something that's dirty. What's it being likened unto? Something that's filthy. Almost every single time. What does that teach us? That an adulterer and the act of adultery is nasty. That it's filthy and that it's dirty. Look at <clears throat> Jeremiah 23, 14. I want you to notice what, how it's worded here. It says this. I have seen also in the prophets of Jerusalem an horrible thing. Notice that. It says it's horrible. The word horrible is only used a couple of times. I think two or three times in the Bible. And horrible thing. And then it says this. They commit adultery. Adultery is not just a regular sin. Now, all sin is not equal. People get this weird idea. All sin is not equal. They all have different punishments. When God gave the law in the Old Testament, the Bible talks about you know, uh, uh, you know, certain people receiving a greater damnation in hell. They're going to be punished differently based on how bad of a life that they live if they're not saved. You know, uh, <clears throat> Jesus said unto Pilate, he, t he said that those that have delivered me unto you have committed the greater sin. You know, greater is a superlative and it expresses a degree of something. So it's, it tells you that there's a greater sin, there's worse sins than other sins. Adultery is a horrible sin. It's not just a small sin. It's not just a mediocre sin because there are such things as small sins. All sin's bad, but there are such things that are smaller sins. They're small sins. Adultery is a huge sin. Adultery is described in the Bible as being something that is horrible. It is being something that brings horror. I want you to think about that. And what do you think of when you think of something that's horror, right? Or horrible. You think of pain normally. You think of something that's damaging. You think of something that is destructive. Adultery is a sin that is a horrible, horrible sin. It is a sin that is a filthy, nasty, and dirty sin. There in Hebrews chapter 13, verse, verse 14, I want to remind you that and read it to you one more time. It says, Marriage is honorable in all, and the bed undefiled. <clears throat> But whoremongers and adulterers, God will judge. What is the person that would go outside of marriage likened unto if he were to go sleep with another outside of his marriage? A whoremonger. And as I've said 50 times, and I want to drive this point home, it's, it's likened unto the other, the other, uh, this other person or this other act. Why? Because it is dirty and it is nasty and it is filthy. Now, you probably are wondering, why do you keep saying that over and over again? Why are you saying it's dirty? Why are you saying it's nasty? Why are you saying it's filthy? The act that takes place between a married couple is a very private, sensual act. Okay, That act was designed to take place only between two people. Right? A man and a woman. It's designed that way. We were created that way. That is actually how God made us. And we are not designed to, you know, to be going outside of that, that, the, the sanctity of that marriage. Because of that, marriage is something that is very sacred. Right? Like it says there, marriage is honorable. That's what that means. It's honorable. It, it, you know, it brings honor you know, to be married. And there's honor that comes with that. And it's a very sacred, sanctified thing, marriage. The act that takes place is what consummates that marriage according to the Bible. That is what brings it together. That is what consecrates it. And that is a very sacred, sanctified act. And it's very private. And it's very intimate. And it's meant to be and it's designed to be between only two people. Now, what I'm going to say right now, I hope this doesn't bother anyone. I don't want to be too detailed. But the, the, the parts of the body of the anatomy that are involved in that act, I just want this to be very clear are in themselves and very naturally the dirtiest part of your body. Right? It is. You just want to study science, it's the dirtiest part of your body. Right? If you were to look at all of your body, that portion of your body is the dirtiest 
It's, the, it's just the nastiest part of your body. Now, you should be showering and cleaning yourselves and trying to be as clean as you possibly could, right? But it's the, it is, of the different parts of your body, it's the dirtiest part of your body. You know the quickest way to spread a disease is through that particular act. Why? Because that's where all of the germs and all of that is, right? Now, <clears throat> I say all that to say this. You wonder why the Bible's repeatedly liking it unto... You wonder why, let me say this too. Let's just look at a, a, an example in real life. Women that are prostitutes or women that do sleep around, what's their health like normally? This is important to everybody to think about. What is their health like usually? Horrible, isn't it? It's normally very bad. And the longer someone is involved in this, what happens? Their health continually goes down, doesn't it? And it continually degrades. Why? Because that particular act is the quickest way to spread germs, to spread disease, to, to spread sicknesses, if you are carrying some sort of disease that is, that is blood-borne or something along those lines or that is, you know, pretty much any sort of way you're carrying it, you know the quickest way to spread it is through that act. And you sit there and wonder, like, why are you saying this is dirty? Why are you saying this is nasty? Why are you saying this is filthy? Because every person in here has some sort of germs in their body. There are people walking around that have diseases that maybe they can't control or diseases that are created through that specific act. And when a person goes around and they just start sleeping around and lying with people all the time, you wonder why, why are you saying that that's filthy? Because that makes you a disgusting person. Just in a literal sense. It makes you a disease-ridden, a disease-infested, a filthy, disgusting person. Just that's a scientific fact. That is what it does. That's the dirtiest part of your body. And if you start sharing that with everybody, you know what you're going to be? You're going to be disgusting. You're going to be dirty. You're going to be a filthy, filthy person. God did not create that to take place like that. God created that to be shared intimately between husband and wife and that not to be spread everywhere. And you know what you are if you want to go around just sleeping with someone? I can guarantee, don't shake my hand. I can guarantee that you're a disgusting, filthy person. Yeah. I can guarantee, the more you do it, the more nasty you're going to be. The more you do it, the, the, the worse your health's going to be. You're going to become more nasty and more filthy and more disgusting. And you wonder why. Why is God likening a person that would go outside of marriage to a whore? Because a whore's filthy and if you're doing that, you're filthy. You know why God's liking it unto a prostitute? Because that's literally what it is. Because prostitutes have diseases and they're gross and they're nasty. Who, who, wants to, who wants to be around a prostitute? Who wants to give a prostitute a ride in their car that's been a prostitute for 50 years? Who wants to go into the bathroom after a prostitute? Why are bathrooms so dirty? Because that's where all the disease and everything is. Because that part of your body is the nastiest part of your body. It's the quickest way and the easiest way to spread disease. That's why people that go around lying with everyone have a bunch of nasty diseases and they're filthy. You know why it's destructive? Because it spreads disease and it's nasty and it's filthy. That's why it's destructive. That's one of the good reasons that we need to understand why you shouldn't go around and be a whoremonger or a whore because you'll be a dirty, filthy, nasty person. And people think probably that are listening to this, I'm sure, they would say, hey, I don't know if kids should be hearing this. Kids should be hearing this. Kids should be hearing this because I don't want my children, I know that I love my children and I don't want my children to be filthy and nasty and dirty. I want my children to understand they want to stay away from whores they want to stay away from even being like a whore or spreading disease and nastiness. I want my kids to be clean. I want them to understand that marriage is honorable and the bed is undefiled. And I want them to keep it that way and stay away from the, the wicked sin of adultery. Go to Leviticus chapter number 20 verse number 10. <clears throat> One of the other reasons why adultery is so destructive is because of the punishment that it is deserving of. <clears throat> Leviticus chapter number 20. <clears throat> Leviticus chapter number 20, <clears throat> verse number 10, the Bible says this, And the man that committeth adultery <coughs> with another's, another man's wife, even he <coughs> that committeth adultery with his neighbor's wife, the adulterer and the adulteress shall surely be put to death. I want you to notice that. That we're speaking, this is God's law. God is the one that gave this law. This is God's opinion. And you say, you know, <clears throat> what does God think should happen to the adulterer? 
What do you think should happen to it? If you were if a Bible believing Christian, if somebody asked you, hey, what do you think should happen to a person that commits adultery? What do you think should happen? Well, I would point you to the Bible. And don't give me this crap of, oh, that's Old Testament, right? Well, the Old Testament is two thirds of your Bible. So if every time I bring up anything in the Bible, you know, two thirds of the time it's probably going to be from the Old Testament. So you just want me to throw out two thirds of the Bible? The Bible says Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He's not changing. His opinions aren't changing. You know what happens is the world gets liberal. That's what happens. The world becomes more liberal. The world becomes more accepting of sin. And then you know what they like to do? Their favorite line? That's the Old Testament. God's not changing. God, is the, God feels the same as He did at the time when, he, when this was pinned down about the sin of adultery. Adultery didn't change. It didn't get... <clears throat> Or it's just not as bad. You know what happened was it became more accepted. That's what happened. You know what happens is cultures become more sinful. And then when, you become, when the culture becomes more sinful, you, you're around it more often. You know more people that are participating in it. You hear about it. You see it. It's shoved down your throat from the media and Hollywood. You know, they try to incorporate it into every, you know, every you know, thing that they put out on any sort of you know, uh, uh, show. So you're just seeing it all the time and it causes you to become, you know, uh, desensitized to it. To where you no longer understand how bad that it is. So we need to, what we need to do is we need to cleanse our mind with the washing of the water by the word, like the Bible says. And we need to get back to what does the Bible teach about how bad and how serious is the sin of adultery. What does the Bible say? It says that the man that commits adultery... With another man's wife, even he that commits adultery. Notice how it's clarifying too. Even he that commits adultery. So the man that does this, it says that commits adultery with his neighbor's wife, the adulterer and the adulteress shall surely be put to death. You know what the punishment should be for adultery? I believe this today. I don't think anything has changed. I believe that a man or a woman that would go outside of the bounds of marriage, I believe that they should be executed. Amen. I believe they should be put to death. Amen. I believe all of the laws of the Bible are perfect. The Bible says the law of the Lord is perfect. I believe it's perfect. Do you know why? And you say, man, that sounds really extreme. That sounds really serious. Yeah, you know why? Because the sin of adultery is very serious. Something very, that is horrible. The Bible describes it as horrible. Wouldn't it make sense that once the punishment is delved out, that it would be horrible? That it would be something that's really strong? If it's such a severe... Now, if, if, if your children does something very small, what type of punishment would you give them? A big punishment? No, you give them a small punishment, right? They do something small, you give them a small punishment. What if they did something big? What if they did something horrible? What are you going to do? You're going to give them a really big punishment. You're going to give them a horrible punishment, right? It's going to be a bad punishment. Well, guess what? Adultery is horrible. And do you know what kind of punishment a person should, should receive? A horrible punishment. I believe this, and I'm not standing up here just blowing hot air. I truly believe the Bible. From the bottom of my feet to the top of my head, I would enact this today if I had a button to push. Amen. All the laws of the Bible, I would enact them immediately. If I had the ability, I would engage it. I don't care if a friend committed it. I don't care if a, if a family member. I don't care if my father committed adultery on my mother. Because God's law trumps all. And you know what would happen? Is every person that was ever guilty of this would suffer the death penalty. And it's practical for many reasons because you know what it does? The victim of this is able to move on with their lives now. The victim of this is able to get more, you know, uh, uh, more uh, uh, reparation. Or they're able to repair their lives in a, in, a, in a better way. It's practical. That's one of the purposes of it. But also because it's a horrible, bad sin, it's in deserving of a horrible, bad punishment. Now this should help us to understand how bad the sin of adultery actually is. And this is another point of why it's so destructive. Why is it destructive? It's deserving of the death penalty. It would, it, what you should deserve from God is to be destroyed. Is to you know, be put to death. I want you to turn now to... <clears throat> Go back to Proverbs chapter number 6. And this is where we're going to end in Proverbs chapter number 6. <clears throat> Proverbs chapter number 6. And notice it says the adulterer and the adulteress. I believe that. Anyone who would be involved in such a horrible act like that, they should both be put to death. Amen. Both of them. <clears throat> 
Proverbs chapter number 6, and I want to begin with verse number 20. <clears throat> we'll begin in verse 27, then we'll move our way up. <laughs> verse number 27 says this, Can a man take fire in his bosom, and his clothes not be burned? Can one go upon hot coals, and his feet not be burned? So, notice what it's saying right here. <clears throat> it's saying, it's basically, you know, the old adage that we would use, like, can you, can you, can you, do you think you're going to be able to play with fire and not be burned? What's, 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 the, what's the answer to that? Of course not, right? You, you know, if you play with fire, you're going to get burned, right? It's basically our old adage. This is where that kind of idea, that, uh, you know, a uh, uh, metaphor comes from. It's basically saying this, that you are going to be punished. That you are, it, that you are going to reap what you sow, basically. That's what this is starting with. So it says, can a man take fire in his bosom and his clothes not be burned? Can one go upon hot coals and his feet not be burned? Verse 29, so he that goeth into his neighbor's wife, whosoever toucheth her, watch this, shall not be innocent. So in the same way that if a man steps aside and commits adultery, he's not going to be innocent. He's not going to, let me, let me explain it further. He's not going to get away with it. He is not going to get away with it. Do you remember Hebrews chapter number 13? It said, a, a, a marriage is honorable in all and the bed undefiled. But then it said this, but whoremongers and adulterers God will judge. I believe that. I believe that God will judge. Any, and that is in the context of saved believers. That's what the whole book of Hebrews is about. It's about punishment of Christians if you're not going to live right. Hebrews chapter 6. Hebrews chapter 12 is where we get the most famous detailed description of the chastisement of a Christian. When we get over to Hebrews chapter 13, it's speaking in the context of Christians. He's writing to Christians. If you were to decide to live a sinful, wicked life like that, I believe that. That if somebody does that, God is going to punish them. If they committed a horrible sin like that, God will punish them in a horrible way. Look at David, King David, when he committed this. He was punished in a terrible way, wasn't he? They're saying you're not going to get away with it. You will not get away with it. Just just guarantee that to anyone in here. Children, adults, anyone who's ever even, even just you know, contemplated this thought in their mind, you will be punished. You will receive a just recompense for your actions. If you start thinking about it, maybe toying with the mind, or maybe, you know, in your mind, playing with this type of thought, what you need to remember is the destructive nature of adultery, and you won't get away with it. That's what people always fall into. Well, I'll be, I'll be real secretive. I'll be real private about it. I'll make sure that I hide it really well. No, you won't. Listen to me. You will not. People, your sin will be found out. I guarantee you. I'm talking to Christians. If Christians want to step outside of marriage and they want to do this, whoremongers and adulterers, God will judge. Can a man play with fire? Can a man take fire in his bosom and not be burned? It's not going to happen. Can a man go upon hot coals and his feet not be burned? It's a stupid question, isn't it? It's meant to be rhetorical. If you want to go outside of marriage and you want to commit this type of act, you will wreck and ruin your life. This is the most destructive sin that exists in the Bible. Look around in your own life. If you, if you don't take the Bible's witness, look around in your own life. And I want you to think about people that have had their lives flipped upside down just in a moment. And you know, every single time when you, when you look around and you see these different examples of people that their lives were wrecked and destroyed, you know what it always points you to? Adultery. Think about that before you even contemplate this stupid sin. Think about that before you even think about doing something so dumb and stupid Amen. like committing adultery. You will ruin and wreck your life like no other sin. You will turn your life upside down. And not only that, and let me make this point too. Adultery is the most selfish sin that exists. It is so stinking selfish and that all, that's all that it is. It's a person thinking only about themselves. They don't care about anybody else because I want you to contemplate for a minute all the people that are affected by this sin. You know, they're all, they're, all they're interested in is, is, is fulfilling their own desires and their own lusts. They don't think about the person that they're hurting, do they? They don't think about their children, do they? They don't think about maybe their parents, do they? They don't think about their in-laws, do they? You know what they do? They don't only really hurt themselves, they destroy everybody's lives around them. And the person that would do this is a self-centered, egocentric, 
just selfish person. That's the kind of person that commits this sin because it's a selfish sin. They only care about themselves. They step outside the bounds of marriage. They forget about their life. They forget about their family. And they go and they commit this wicked, horrible sin. It's a selfish person. A selfish person is an arrogant person. That's the kind of person that does this. That is the kind of per Because what is an arrogant person? They're a person that thinks and cares only about themselves. They don't care about other people. They care about themselves only. The, this type of sin is a selfish sin. You know, I've heard people talk about other sins and <clears throat> why other sins are bad. This sin is more selfish than any other sin It's because it's more destructive than any other sin. And that destruction does not only fall upon you or the person that is your victim. It, it falls upon everyone around you. Right. You wonder why, why you say it's so destructive. What do, you, what do they call a woman that sleeps with a married man? A home wrecker. Why? Because it destroys people's lives. That's why. Because it's the most destructive transgression or sin that exists. I hope everyone's getting the point why I am harping on this right now so bad and so long. Is this, this is why. Before you go into and commit or even think about and act like this, I want you to know and understand two things. Number one, you will get caught. You will get caught. You think you're going to walk on hot coals and not get burned? You know what I would call that person? An idiot. You're an idiot if you think that you're going to walk on hot coals and your feet are not going to get burned. If you think that you're going to take fire in your bosom, if you're going to think about how retarded that would be. If there was a fire, we had started a fire right here, and I just picked up the fire and took it into my bosom. I'm like, nothing's going to happen, guys. I'll be fine. What would you say I am? An idiot? You'd say I'm stupid, wouldn't you? That's how stupid you are if you're contemplating the thought of saying, I'm just going to go you know, sleep outside of marriage. Nobody will find out. Nobody's going to find out. Whoremongers and adulterers, God will judge. You will be punished. You will be found out. God will find out. You know, obviously, God knows everyone will find out. And, you're, and, and the embarrassment and the shame and then all other sorts of punishments will come along with it. So number one, I want everyone to understand that you're not going to get away with it. Adults, children, listen to me and remember these words. You will not get away with it. If you ever even consider committing adultery and you're a saved person, you will not get away with it. God will make sure that it's found out and that you are punished for your sin. Number one. Number two, let me promise you something else. <clears throat> it's not just going to blow over. It's not just going to be something like, honey, I did this. And then it's just like, okay, that's not what this is like. It is going to destroy your life. It is going to destroy their life. It is going to destroy your children's lives, your parents' lives, your in-laws' lives, anyone that is close and directly connected with this situation. It is going to harm and hurt and damage people badly. Just like fire. That's why it's like an under fire. It's going to hurt you and damage you and destroy you badly. Does it sound like something you should even think about doing? Of course not. Look at Proverbs chapter 6 again now. Verse 30. Men do not despise a thief if he steal to satisfy his soul when he is hungry. But if he be found, he shall restore sevenfold. Now I want you to notice it said, if he be found. What did it just get done explaining? If you take fire in your bosom, you'll get burned. Saying, it will be found. That's the point. That's why he's likening it now unto a thief. If a thief did this, you will be found. He says, he shall restore sevenfold. He shall give all of the substance of his house. Now listen, what just happened? What is he just explaining? Do you know what he's explaining right there? It's resolved. Think about that. It's resolved. How do you, how do you if you're a thief and you've stolen, how do you resolve it in the Bible? You pay it back sevenfold like he said. And what now? Is it gone? Is it done? It's over. It's over. It's been, the, 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 the transgression's resolved. But look what it says next. But whoso committeth adultery with a woman lacketh understanding. He that doeth it destroyeth his own soul. Do you know what it's saying? It's, not, it's, it's irreparable. You can, and I'm telling you, try your best. But there still will be wounds. There still be, will be scars. <clears throat> you're going to destroy your own soul. And then it says this in verse 33, just to prove that this is not just my interpretation, this is what the Bible's teaching, a wound and dishonor shall he get, watch this, and his reproach 
shall not be wiped away. What's it explaining? It's not going to go away. Adultery is something that will be with you until the day you die, unfortunately. It will be with you until the day that you die. Adultery, and you, you, can, you can move past it and you can get peace and comfort. But it's one of those sins that will be there forever and you'll never forget about it. It's not, it's not something like the theft. You just wipe it away and it's gone. Why? Because it's that bad and it's that destructive. Right. <clears throat> and then it goes on, it says, For jealousy is the rage of a man, therefore he will not spare in the day of vengeance. He will not regard any ransom, neither will he rest content, though thou givest many gifts. <coughs> that shows how bad it is, how angry you would make a husband if you were to do something like that with his wife. I can attest to this, that if that ever happened, I would, I promise you, I would, I would put a round in that person's head or I would beat them to a bloody pulp with my bare hands. I can promise you that. That if that ever took place, I don't care how, how everything correlated, but I would 100% kill that person. Do you know why? Because it's that bad. Right. Because it's a bad sin. Because it's a horrible sin. So it brings about severe anger. What if your wife just lied to you? What if, you're, what if, what if something else, would it bring about that much anger? Of course not. But that kind of anger brings about a jealousy and an anger that is like burning in your bosom where you are literally ready and prepared to kill somebody. If someone, if you walked in and such an act was going on, well, you hear stories about that, don't you? And people literally kill people, right? It's because it's so bad. And, it's, and you know what it is? It it's, it's also has to do with that selfish type of behavior where they're just not thinking about the other person. Uh, I, want, I want to back up because I want to end here with the, with the way to, because this whole sermon is preached so that people, if you've ever done it, you don't do it again. Or if you <coughs> haven't done it, you never do it. That's the purpose, is to warn people about this sin and understand the destructive nature of this sin. So I'm going to give you ways real quick. I'm just going to read through this list. I'm not going to elaborate or articulate on them because I, I touched on them already. The ways to prevent adultery. They're understanding these ways. Understand the severity of the sin in God's eyes. You put the death penalty on it, right? And that's what number two is. Understanding the deserving punishment. Number three, understanding the repercussions. Just inherently, what repercussions is it going to bring about with your family and how everything's going to work, about, work out after that. Understand how dirty and filthy that it is. It's disgusting. It's nasty. Understanding what it does to others around you. Understanding that it's irreparable. That you can't move past it completely. Unfortunately. <clears throat> And this is another really good way for, for, for married, uh, uh, um, you know, uh, for, for those that are married, married couples, is make sure you have a good relationship with your spouse. Make sure you have a good relationship with your spouse. Sometimes it's, it would happen anyways, but this is a great way to, to prevent it. It's another precautionary step to take to make sure that your relationship is a great relationship. And don't be private. I don't agree with that and I don't like that idea at all where there's this privacy of where one couple can't get it, one, one person can't get into the other person's phone or computer or whatever it is. That's not right. That's not okay. I don't believe that that should ever take place or that should ever happen. That leads to bad things, to you looking at bad things, to doing bad things, to maybe talking to people you shouldn't be talking to. You know, bad thoughts, your spouse. I mean, obviously, you don't want to just, you want to have some couth and, you know, have a good relationship. So it's not just like, let me see your phone. See what you've been looking at, right? It shouldn't be like that, you know, unless you had something go on. But, you know, that's not how it should be, right? It should be like if your wife wants to just pick up your phone and look at something, there shouldn't be anything to hide, right? It's frustrating that that is so, such a hard, you know, concept for people. You should be able to just look at your other spouse's phone, you should be able to just look at the computer. There shouldn't be any reason why they couldn't. Why would you care if they just looked at it real quick, right? You don't need privacy from your, you know, from your, your spouse. That doesn't make any sense. You need your privacy from the person you're married to. You live in the same, you sleep two feet from each other. I mean, how much stinking privacy do you think you have, right? You know, it, it, it's a stupid idea. Make sure that you have a great relationship with your spouse. You need to have a very good relationship. You need to work on your relationship and continually grow your relationship. Your, your husband or your wife needs to be your best friend. I believe that. Your husband or your wife needs to be 
your best friend. You need to be best friends with one another. You know, there's a, uh, the verse that Jessica and I, would, I can't remember how it goes right now, but there's a verse that Jessica and I will quote back and forth to each other, just kidding around with each other, but it's true. Uh, it's, from, it's taken from <coughs> Song of Solomon, where she, he's, he's referred to as her friend. You know, or, or she refers to him as, his, as her friend. You know, and that's how it should be. You should be your best friend. You should have a great relationship with your spouse. This is a great way to prevent this from taking place. Sometimes it happens anyways. It's not just like, oh, you know, my, you know, I was, somebody committed adultery on me. Well, then you just must have had a crappy relationship. That's not always the case. I've heard people say that. That's not always the case. Sometimes people are just crappy people and they just are, you know, they have other things or whatever it may be. I don't know the hearts of every single person, but that's not always the case. Number seven, this is the last point I need to end right now in the conclusion. This is very important. Understand that it begins in the heart. Adultery begins in the heart. I preached a sermon. I hope everyone remembers it because it's very important. About three, four months ago. And is, do you know what I'm getting ready to get at? Do you, what is the title of the sermon? It's good to know. Or, or what was the subject? Covetousness. Covetousness is the first step to all sin. No exceptions. The Bible teaches it over, and I demonstrate it when you agree, over and over and over again. Covetousness is the first step to all sin. You know why the Bible says that, you know, that the love of money is the root of all evil? Because covetousness is, where, is the root of all evil. That's what that's saying. Coveting after more money. This is taught how many times in the Bible? Over and over and over again, just clear passages. You, need to, you know what you need to do to prevent yourself from falling into the physical act of adultery? Don't do it in your heart. I want you to go to uh, uh, Matthew chapter... Actually, I'll read you from Matthew 5. You don't have to turn there, I'm sorry. Look at Proverbs 6. Proverbs chapter number 6, verse number 23. This is the beginning of this, and it says this, For the commandment is a lamp, and the law is light, and reproofs of, of instruction are the way of life. To keep thee from the evil woman, from the flattery of the tongue of a strange woman. So it begins there with the commandment, right? And then it says this, verse 25, notice this. Lust not after her beauty in thine heart, neither let her take thee with her eyelids. What's the very first step and the very first warning? Don't let it begin in your heart. Don't look around. It is a, the Bible's very clear that it is a sin to even look at and desire a woman in any kind of fashion or any kind of way like that. In any way. Matthew 5, 27 says, You have heard that it was said by them of old time, Thou shalt not commit adultery. This is Jesus, verse 28. But I say unto you, that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her, hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. Obviously, it's not the physical act and it's not near as bad. But the fact that he would say, You've committed adultery already with her in your heart. That's, it shows how serious it is even to just look at another woman and lust after her. Even to just look at another woman. This is one of the Ten Commandments as well. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife. It's a commandment not to look at and to desire your neighbor's wife or any other woman that is not your wife. That's a command. And the same thing goes for women desiring men that are not their husbands. Obviously, there's no exception. It's wicked if a man or a woman both do it. Right? This is where it begins. All sin begins in the mind. All sin starts with covetousness, which is a sin in and of itself. This is, you say, I want to guard my heart from sin. I want to guard my heart specifically from adultery. Do you know what the, the number one thing to do is? Make sure you nip it in the bud. Make sure that you're not even thinking about it. Make sure that immediately when the thought occurs in your mind, that's a terrible, wicked thought. That's a horrible thought. I'm not going to think about that. Think about your wife in place of that. When that thought starts to pop up in your mind, or think about your husband. How would they feel about it if they knew about the wicked thoughts that are in your heart? The wicked thoughts that are in your mind. Every person that has ever committed any sin, it began with covetousness. But let me do it in this context. Every person that has ever committed adultery, not one single person ever just did the act without thinking about it first. You have to first think about it. Desire it, want it, lust after it, covet it in your heart, and then you go do it. Everyone. Everyone. You know where it begins? The heart. So you know what you need to get control of and you need to guard? Your heart. This is the most important point if you say, hey, what's the prevention? What's the medicine for that? You know, we, you know, we want the cure. We want to take it. It's preventative medicine to make sure it never happens. You guard your heart and you do so by not allowing these thoughts to enter into your heart. 
So notice, lust not after her beauty in thine heart, neither let her take thee with her eyelids. And you know what it goes into next? The destructive nature of adultery. This is also very similar to, similar to Proverbs chapter 23 when it talks about wine and alcohol. It begins with, look not thou upon the wine. And then what does it explain? The destructive nature of alcohol. What does this say? Lust not after her beauty. Saying, don't even look at it. And then it says, why? For by means of a whorish woman, a man is brought to a piece of bread. That's another destructive nature of adultery. You'll be broke. I can guarantee you. You think, that's a, you think this is a, you know, a coincidence? That it explains like a person that's broke? Think about all the men that went out there and decided to get, go outside of marriage. You know what ends up happening? 99.99% of them, they end up losing their families most of the time. They end up losing their wife, their kids. They lose everything. They end up paying a massive amount of child support and they end up being broke. Living by themselves, living alone, just them and a piece of bread. That's all that they have. Just barely anything to get by. You want to commit adultery? It's going to destroy your life. You'll be brought to a piece of bread. You'll be filled with diseases. You'll be, God will come down on you like a ton of bricks and you will be punished severely. You're not going to get away with it. You will not get away with it. It's a horrible sin and it will dealt, be dealt with horribly. God still feels the same about the death penalty. So what is he going to do with, in you, with you in your life if you were to fall into such a wicked sin? Guard your heart. Don't, even, don't allow it. It's a wicked sin. Even, you know, adultery is horrible. It's a wicked sin to just sit there and lust after other women. Don't look at horrible images and don't do it in person either. Completely abstain from just looking in your heart at other women that are not your wife or other men that are not your husband. That's how you stop yourself from committing adultery. It's a very serious sin. Let's make sure that we take heed to this. So we don't end up being on the other end of this. There's so many times you've been warned about things I'm sure in your life and you wish, I wish I would have listened. I know that I, that happened to me when I was a kid so much. And even as an adult, you know, none of us are perfect. Man, I wish I would have not done that. I knew I shouldn't have done that. This is one of those things that after it's said and done, it's not just like you stole something. You're going to have regrets for the rest of your life and you'll never forget about it. It's horrible. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, God, we love you so much and we're so thankful for the warnings that you give us, dear Lord, about adultery. Help us to guard our hearts, dear Lord. Help us to, to protect ourselves from this wicked sin and please just guide us with your Holy Spirit. Give us a double portion when it comes to this that no one here, the children, the adults, would ever you know, fall, fall uh, into such a, a wicked sin and, and we love you so much. We ask you that you would <coughs> be with every person that's here, all the children uh, and, and all the adults as well, that they would uh, uh, just, just grow more in your word and would grow closer to you and would live just in general a more holy, sanctified life that would be pleasing to you. Uh, bless our church and be with us. And we love you so much. And in Jesus Christ's name, amen.